All right, so course outline for today. This first page is really just uh, outline of what I'm planning on talking about. Starting seeds, seedling needs, soil preparation, spring fertility, planting and transplanting solutions, drenches and foliar sprays, uh, conductivity in bricks, whole system understanding, symptomology, you know, talking about you know, how to read the plant based on its look, the shape of the leaf, the color of the leaf, things like that. Um, seminal thinkers and their thoughts. These are, this is sort of, the, I guess those first three slides there are a rough overview of what we're planning on talking about today. Reducing limiting factors, um, early childhood development. I think I referred to this yesterday, but let's just start in on this right now. The concept that there's a very uh, similar dynamic with what life experience is you know, at birth and just thereafter. Your brain is very plastic. They say it's very malleable. Um, your psychic uh, capacities, your, your bone density, your immune system function, uh, a lot of the stuff is not set when you're born. The environmental conditions after birth help determine what your trajectory is for life. And once that's set, then it's difficult to change. You can change it, but you know, the trajectory, the course is set for this incarnation. So um, as it is with, with humans, for people who are familiar with early childhood development, so it is also with plants. Some of the critical environmental conditions uh, we talked about yesterday. Uh, one of them I didn't talk about was soaking of seed. Um, a minor uh, point, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, beginning the germination process uh, through soaking seed um, you know, can facilitate germination of things that otherwise would be difficult to germinate. If you have a hard time getting spinach to germinate in the you know, summertime or, or things like that, if you can soak the seed, uh, you can get basically it to soak, it'll, it'll begin to expand and that germination process will begin. Spinach is a large seed, so it's not that hard to work with when it's wet. Um, carrots, getting carrots to germinate, soaking them first means they get all stuck together, so that's a pain in the butt. You can do it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult. <laughs> I just saw John's uh, farm yesterday afternoon, really, I think, a very ingenious way of carrot starting and spacing and transplanting. There are you know, lots of cool people putting together pieces of the puzzle of how do we facilitate this. We, we know we have these historical struggles. How can we practically address them and, and really move the, sk move the skills and the knowledge forward? I will generally only soak my seed when it's uh, a otherwise fairly um, adversarial environmental conditions. As an example, we have, I think I said yesterday, about a half an acre of hoop houses and um, brassicas being the kind of persnickety people they are, as soon as the winter solstice passes, um, they begin to go to seed. Anybody who's ever had that experience with their mizuna and you know, bok choy and arugula and everything else, they're like, okay, time to reproduce. And you're like, no, I was gonna pick you for the next three months. And like, no, you're not. Some of them are let, allowed to go to seed and other ones are taken out and new, new seeds put in. Um, and where I live in February, it's generally pretty cold out. Um, every now and then we'll get a little warm spell where it'll be above freezing for a couple days. Um, and so I wanna get the seeds into the ground and germinated during that very short window of really less than optimal environmental conditions. And so one thing I do to help facilitate that process is to soak the seed. Um, what's that? For how long? A um, couple hours. Uh, in a little, uh, I got a little mix that's, uh, I use 4% uh, kelp, 1% seawater, and 95% water um, as a sort of nice little you know, trace element and growth hormone stimulant um, to sort of ex facilitate the process. It is difficult to take lettuce seeds, as an example, um, put them in water, then get the water out of them and make it so you can spread them evenly. Uh, basically means putting them through like a, a tea strainer and then laying them out on uh, you know, a counter or a paper towel when it's next to the wood stove where it's hot and a little bit dry until they can not stick together anymore before they dry out. Um, and then you can spread them. So to facilitate germination, ensuring the seeds are moist ahead of time and beginning to soak up water does really help. So I'll just leave it there. Um, inoculants, we talked about inoculant yesterday. Potting soil minerals, we talked about that. Um, biological activity being critical in the soil, in the potting soil if you're starting your seedlings inside because you want to train your plants from birth to be feeding themselves through feeding the soil life. You start your plants off on soluble nutrients and you're never going to get that digestive system function that's basically, you know, you get your kids to eat Gatorade and um, macaroni and cheese from birth to age five. They're going to be set on a certain trajectory, different from kids that are not eating that. If anybody knows what I'm talking about. Yes. 
<clears throat> um, it's important what you feed them early, right? Get, them, get their tastes set for certain kinds of food and then <laughs> they've got a trajectory. Uh, temperature of soil and temperature of air. Um, I didn't talk about this yesterday. We understand this 70 degree thing. In the wintertime, thermostats are set for 70 degrees. In the summertime, thermostats are set for 70 degrees. Uh, I've seen that happen. You read the, the Johnny seed catalog and they, they say, you know, germination percent based on soil temperature, you know, at 50 degrees soil temperature, you'll get, you know, 50% germination. At 60 degrees soil temperature, you'll get, you know, 75% germination. At 70 degrees soil temperature, you'll get 95% you know, germination. At 80 degrees soil temperature, you'll get 75% germination. So there's an optimal, you know, window in soil temperature for plants uh, that's similar to air temperature for animals. And it seems actually uh, for bacteria and fungi also. It's not just the plants and the animals that like 70 degrees, it's also the bacteria and the fungi. And um, so what you should expect to be having happen in cold soil in the spring is limited biological activity. I know a lot of people are in, always in a rush to get things into the ground first and have the first crops to the farmer's market and things like that. Um, my experience has been if you wait until the soil warms up, if you wait until the climate actually, you know, now it's actually, late spring, right? Frosts are over. Instead of trying to push things in and put them in early and, you know, get them into cold soil, they sit there for a while and struggle. Uh, my experience has been you put them in a little bit later when the soil's warmer and actually um, systemically things do much more well. So understand the, 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 the concept that the soil temperature affects biological activity. If you want to put things in early, then get the soil warmed up early. Do it in a hoop house. We're planting our carrots and beets, our first plantings of carrots and beets, in a hoop house right now. We're putting in our, our peas in a hoop house. I am happy to put peas in in April in a hoop house, not outside where the soil is, you know, barely above freezing and not going to be really above 40 for till the end of the month. But I can do it in a hoop house where basically we have a, in, a, an environment where the soil temperature is being, you know, artificially uh, inflated or raised. So, um, just a concept there. Uh, understand the connection between soil temperature and biological activity and the plants being able to be fed. Um, don't expect them to be fed, be fed in a cold soil because bacteria and fungi aren't working well. Uh, root and top balance, I think we sort of obliquely touched on it but didn't really get into it. There's these uh, hormones that are produced by growing root tips and growing leaf tips. Um, they're called uh, auxins and cytokinins. A healthy plant will have a very sort of a broad bushy structure. Think about a oak tree that was planted on the side of the road or grew up on the side of the road and didn't have any competition or in the middle of a field. You know that look, that look of a tree, a big beautiful arching tree? Um, that's the structure we want our plants to have. That's a structure of a balanced system where you have the, a big broad arching root system and a big broad arching top, they, there's, the, there's a hormonal system that keeps those all things in check. What happens when they're getting leggy is basically the bottom, the, the growth hormones that are being produced by the roots stop being produced or they're produced at lower levels and the growth hormones being produced by the, by the leaves are still being produced and so you get this hormonal imbalance. As soon as that plant begins to get leggy, begins to stretch out, you're basically setting in a hormone imbalance for that plant. If you don't do anything about it for the rest of its life, it's really not the kind of thing you want to be doing. Um, and uh, there's a critical balance between the top and the bottom that must be understood and maintained and really supported. If you are setting up an imbalance, you want to set up an imbalance where the root is stronger than the top. Because the more the roots grow, at some point, the more energy is going to be kicked back up into the plant. You know, there is a role for pruning as far as I'm concerned if the plants get leggy. If they begin to stretch out, if they begin to shift from that broad arching structure to a tall gangly structure, that's the time for pruning. Because then, but you also have to solve the underlying issue, which is why, why is this imbalance happening in the first place? If it's happening because your seedlings are in little pots and you haven't taken them out of the pots, you have to solve that problem. I talked about broccoli yesterday and broccoli heads that don't turn into decent sized heads because they were kept in the pot for too long. It's the hormone imbalance thing that occurs when the roots hit the edge and the plant gets leggy um, that that's, that's actually you know, the, the, the vehicle by which this all occurs, um, is that hormone imbalance. So if you've heard about hormone imbalance, if you know about the effect of hormone imbalance on humans, understand the effect on plants. It's really not something you want to be setting up in your five-year-olds, right? You don't want that 
it's not helpful to them. So uh, just the whole thing about when you start your seedlings, how big the root ball is, when you plant them in, all this stuff is, I think, worthy of, of reconsidering. Um, I would suggest maybe starting a few seeds totally late, letting them just germinate and wait for the first ones to just germinate and stick them in the ground right away and see how they do in relation to the way you've always done things. Just try it out and see what happens. Yes? So years ago when I was first starting out, a friend had not been able to keep up with what they were doing and had like 20 flats of this fancy red butterhead lettuce that they just were going to throw away. <coughs> I took them and I had access to lots of nettles. I made a nettle fermentation, gave them lots of high nitrogen nettle tea. They grew into a gorgeous crop. It was one of my first best, most profitable crops. Do you think I reduced the nutritional value by doing that? Some plants are less particular than other plants are. Um, so lettuce is something that, you know, if you get lettuce into an optimal environment, you'll get pound and a half, two pound heads. Some gargantuan, ridiculous, fill up a bottom of a bushel basket with one head of lettuce. Um, and in most cases, we put our lettuce on eight inch centers. Um, and so we get this head that's, you know, decent sized. So I was talking more about the, 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 the yield potential than the nutritional well, effects. Yeah, I know, but they get behind and they stunt their plants, they can pull them back out of it with a burst of nitrogen. You certainly can pull them back out. Um, it's, not that they, it's not that they're dead, you have to give up on them. Yeah. Um, but the idea is if we're trying to push the envelope as far as overall system function, um, stopping doing the things like starting it, stop, stop planting them so damn early. Yeah. Right. Do, 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 do <laughs> and give them bigger root balls. Yeah. When I was hearing from you, I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't tell people to do that because they're actually not growing anything that's got any nutritional value. I don't think it necessarily affects the nutritional value significantly, although I don't know because we haven't really looked at it. I think what really happens is that the yield is stunted. The biggest issue I'm trying to convey here is, is the yield effect. Um, See, I think that if I give them enough nitrogen, I can get them completely out of stunting, that they come back and yield just fine. So if you take a 14-year-old um, and you, you know, inject them with... Um, um, a human growth hormone, uh, they will bulk up nicely, right? And their balls will, you know, atrophy and their bones will become weak, but they will have big muscles. So that's what I was asking if you thought yeah. that it affected the nutritional value. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, how are you going to be giving them nitrogen if it's a if it's a nettle tea? That's pretty legit. I mean, as far as you know, materials you're going to be using. So it's all a continuum. What's exciting to me is I don't think we know anything, really. We've got some general, like, I think probably in this direction, and I'm pretty much sure this is the case, but as far as, like, really understanding any of this, uh, you know, <laughs> anybody who thinks they do, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> I mean, I can learn a few things. Yeah, good. All right, my last um, uh, point on this slide is the word intention. Uh, just a quick anecdote here. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was... Um, part of a, um, what's it called, a mentorship program uh, with a local organic farming organization, uh, NOFA. So someone who had taken this course and said, you know, was a part of the program, said, would you be my mentor? I said, sure. Part of the process was you go to the f farm and you, and, you, and you walk around and see what's going on. And so this story happened that day. I was on the farm walking around and uh, Liz was the farmer and she had about an acre of mixed vegetables and she'd been, you know, she'd taken the course, she was very diligent and followed through with things. <laughs> so she was, you know, I, I, I'm like, Liz, things look great, you know, the tomatoes are gorgeous, the chard's shiny, like, potatoes are rocking, you know, I don't see any insects, it's, you know, nice shiny leaves, big broad, big thick, dark, like, what do you want me to tell you? Good job. <laughs> I know lots of people that would happily trade their farm for yours. Like, the, you're doing good. So I was like, no, 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 keep going, keep going. So we, whatever. I was walking through the field. I got out there, kept walking down the, down the, it was on the side of a hill, got about a halfway down, came to the onion, onion patch, and I was like, what the hell did you do to your onions? She's like, nothing different. I'm like, <laughs> everything else looks nice, but these onions are like, whew. I've never seen perfect, amazing, every single one gargantuan, just beautiful, exceptional onion. I've never seen onions this good. You sure you didn't do anything different to the onion? She's like, no. All right, well, they look, everything else looks good. They look really good. Um, but we're continuing down the field, looking at you know, the brassicas and um, the rest of the crops. And uh, we got down to the bottom and she's like, oh, I think, I, I think, I remember what it was. It's like, what? 
She said, well, it was, you know, February 15th and everybody's getting spring fever and <laughs> stir crazy and wants to play in the dirt. And we're all, you know, really excited about playing, about starting onions. And um, before we started planting onions, we just stopped for a second and had a moment and a blessing. And I was like, oh, I needed something. I, <laughs> I was pretty sure something different happened because these guys are really rocking, but that would explain it. It's the role of you um, and the other humans in the process. And this is what a green thumb is, as far as I'm concerned, um, is the presence that you bring, the, the, the consciousness, the intention. When I was a kid, uh, we had uh, people come on the farm that were woofers and you know apprentices and people were vegetarians and you know like that's all the struggle about you know are we going to cook two meals for everybody because we're not vegetarians and there was all this you know like judgment about you eat meat and you're like thoughtless and insensitive and and I, I remember being you know fairly young and just sort of like working this one through in my head and I was like if you were a piglet that was born to a sow on a farm, you would probably have a pretty good idea of what your life path was likely to be, right? It's like you knew ahead of time where you're headed. Um, so it's not like it's like, oh, I'm taking this wild animal out of nature. And like, my thought was, you wanna give this piglet who knows where it's headed, headed the best possible life. And it has chosen this life and on some level, it has chosen to be feeding me, and so I should be grateful and thankful and treat it as well as I can. But this is the contract, basically. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's assumed by, this, by the fact that it chose to be here. And um, I feel the same way about plants. Um, you know, how is it insensitive to kill a pig and eat it, and it's not insensitive to kill a broccoli and eat it? Um, pretty sure a broccoli seed that came on a broccoli plant at a farm that was growing broccoli seed knew where it was headed. It was headed to a seed packet that was going to be planted on the farm that was going to grow and it was going to be picked. Pretty sure it chose ahead of time its incarnation and I see it all as sentient and what I would like to say is let's appreciate, acknowledge that sentience and, um, and appreciate it and respect it and be present with it. And um, I don't know, there's all kinds of stories and, and thoughts and ideas about how to do all this. Um, there's this thing, can't fool dogs and children, right? Some people, they walk up the driveway, the dogs bark at them. Those are the same people that if you give them the baby to hold, the baby starts, starts crying, right? <laughs> Those are the people that have a vibe that's just not right. There's something about their energy is dissonant. Those are the people that when they're transplanting seedlings in the field, half of them die, I would say. And they're not bad people necessarily, but there's something off about their vibe. And, um, you know, dogs and children don't understand English. What they understand is vibe. They understand the space you hold, they understand the energy you hold. And so, for me, the energy you hold when you're dealing with your plants uh, is, is extraordinarily important. You know, are you appreciative? Are you thankful? Are you joyful? Are you nice to be around? Or are you not nice to be around? If you're nice to be around, they're gonna feel happy in your presence in that same way that dogs and children will, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I will talk more about this as we proceed through the day, but in general, starting at, at the beginning, um, having that, taking a moment for that. And I don't recommend ceremony or, you know, you know, speeches. Like I would suggest that's the feeling that's the important part. And, you know, you can happily go about your process of expressing deep gratitude in the presence of five other people and they have no idea. I mean, I would suggest that's much more the way we should be aiming this whole thing is, is to have that sense to engage that aspect. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that about starting seeds. Um, I think it's a really, um, this plant is joyfully offering to grow its body to feed you or to you know, provide for your family and feed someone else. 
it's doing it of its own free will with joy. And you should be, you know, honor that, accept that, you know, appreciate it. Say, thank you very much. I'm so thankful. Look how beautiful you are. Like, I don't think this is going to hurt at all, right? And you don't have to say it out loud if you feel self-conscious. Um, but that attitude, I think, is really, really important. It's not just about, you know, how the planter works and, you know, the numbers of seeds you're planting and... That attitude is not fun to be around. And they're alive and they feel it. Yeah, there's lots of wisdom on this to whole topic, but I just feel like in many cases, when we talk about farming, we talk about logistics and details, and we don't talk about intention. Um, and you know, I'm still trying to suss out that whole thing about I talk, we talked about yesterday about Steiner's comments about why we aren't able to hold higher consciousness, and you know, the food not having enough soul force and intention. I know uh, a friend of mine who is a, a close student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, a founder of TM, um, and he was you know later in his years, especially focusing a lot on, on food and food quality and helping having food quality be a piece of the rounding of higher consciousness. And they did this whole Vedic organic farming thing. And she's got a couple of good quotes from him where he basically was saying, the primary role of the farmer is to intend for the plants. Mm -hmm. Like once you get them into the ground, which shouldn't be a big deal, like if you're on top of the managing of logistics thing, which is, you know, a lot of us aren't, but um, the intending, the you know, the feeling, the envisioning, like I can see this zucchini going to feed someone, to heal them, to vitalize them, like taking a moment to actually go into that space and feel it and intend it. Um, there's a lot there. And bird, bird song, joyful bird song, you know, is this wonderfully invigorating, you know, force that actually causes stomata to open. And have you know about this, what they say in the Amazon about the, the tree frogs? <clears throat> you know how the, like the tree frogs, do their thing when it's going to rain. You know, it's like, you know, you know it's going to rain when the tree frogs start going on? And the Amazon, they say, it's the tree frogs that bring the rain. It's the, it's the frequency of their call that helps the clouds coalesce that actually makes the rain happen. It's like, what is causal? What's, what's the cause? What's the effect? Um, how does it all work? It's really interesting. We'll talk more about frequencies and stuff after lunch. What's that? It really shows that with the frogs. Emerald forest is Emerald really forest. remarkable. Yeah. yeah. And then they have found, just briefly, the same as the birds encourage and bring out the growth. The fish and the coral reefs do the same thing. They have these little songs that they have found that they're singing that cause the coral to grow too. Cause the coral to grow. Yeah, sound is very powerful. People talk about sound healing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's get past the just NPK stuff onto the next. <laughs> Everybody talks about that. Let's go to the other cool stuff. <laughs> All right. So page two, cover crop to crop process. Imagining that you have done a good job um, getting your uh, seedlings started, um, or the best you can, and you're getting ready to put them into the ground. We're taking the ground as it currently exists. Uh, there's, of course, all these different permutations. It's bare soil. There's cover crops growing on it. There's mulched. It's dead cover crops You know that were winter-killed cover crops, so I can't go into all those details. But this is what I'm going to be talking about now, is going from that stage to getting your plants into the ground. This is our next major conversation. Um, in general, my thought is, in my experience, if I do a good job getting the plants into the ground, if they're into the ground well, there's very little work for me to do until picking time. Um, I, may just, I may mentioned this yesterday. I said, you know, a lot of people spend the heat of the summer outside weeding and doing things like that, which I have done enough of in my life, and so I try not to do that anymore. Um, if I get my plants into the ground well, if I create the environment where the plants, my crops are flourishing, uh, weeding is really a, a minor, or if at all, process. Right? It's, if, you, if you do manage things well, um, there's actually a lot of free time for swimming and napping and things like that in July, um, which are much more pleasurable than being out in the beating down sun. So the process of getting the crops into the ground. First bullet point says address mineral deficiencies based on soil test results and recommendations. Hopefully you've done that. Always apply minerals with a carbon source like humates or compost or biochar. Um, specifically trace elements that are soluble. Uh, it's good to buffer them with some kind of an organic material. I said getting things pre-digested is always best. So if you want to put things into your compost pile when you're building it, when it's done composting, they'll be much more bioavailable. Apply your fertilizer, whatever fertilizer you apply. I'm not going to say uh, go cold turkey on it. You know, feel free to continue doing what you're doing. Some people use a, 
you know, compost. Some people use a, a bagged organic fertilizer with bone meal and blood meal and feather meal. Some people use composted chicken manure. Um, I don't particularly care what you use, but I would generally, you know, put that onto the ground before um, preparing the bed. I want to get that worked into the bed in whatever way I'm going to be preparing it. Um, I'm going to write down my recipe for what I use. I just, you know, in answer to John's question earlier, I said I put a thousand pounds per acre of minerals down on an annual basis that I sort of see as this is what I'm going to be taking out of the soil. I want to put it back in uh, ahead of time. <clears throat> so let me just write that down for you uh, quickly. And this total, I think, is a thousand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, a thousand pounds per acre. So this is just a mix of goodies that I consider to be a broad spectrum, you know, suite of. Of, of nice things to, that soil likes. Um, uh, if you have an excess of calcium in your soil, then remove the lime and the gypsum. If you've got too much phosphorus, remove the rock phosphate. If you've got too much potassium, take out the green sand. Right? This is not a thou shalt by any stretch of the imagination list. This is a general goodie bag mix. These are pounds per acre, um, and that's what I use if you're curious. Yes, John? So I know you buy most of this, you know, all but probably uh, in bulk, large quantities, you have sources for most of it. Um, for your cost, what's on the list right there, do you have a rough uh, estimate in terms of what? Uh, a friend of mine, so the question is how much does this stuff cost? Um, a friend of mine actually um, makes it for me. He lives in Pennsylvania, and we actually have it in the mineral depots for the organization. We call it Spring Blend. And I think it's... $600 a ton or $500 a ton, which is $200 to $300 an acre, uh, something in that range. Um, okay, so apply fertilizer, uh, till under the cover crop, uh, pull back the mulch, whatever your process is going to be for preparing the bed. Um, we, we, I just, we can't go into all the nuances, but um, I'm, I'm assuming um, that you know what you're going to be doing to prepare the bed. Um, the general suggestions are keep it covered as much as possible. Um, till as shallowly as you can get away with. Um, but that being said, you know, you have to do what you have to do for logistic, log logistics purposes, and that is fine. For the bed, make your rower whole. Um, and then I got the next line says test conductivity. I want to talk about conductivity for a little while. I think it's a really exciting and important piece of the puzzle um, that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. When I first uh, realized that there were ways to proactively monitor what was going on to see ahead of time before plants got sick that they were running out of gas. Um, it blew my mind. I had always sort of assumed that you put the plants in the ground and you sort of hope and then you get three weeks and then the flea beetles come in or the powdery mildew comes in and you're basically like, yeah, well, that's what happened last year. Um, I never knew there's ways you could monitor the system in, you know, and see ahead of time what your likely situation was and, you can, and be able to predict when they're going to get sick based on certain environmental conditions. And that's what's so exciting about the refractometer, the bricks, which we'll talk about after lunch, and the conductivity, which we're talking about right now. Uh, these, are some, these are two really simple tools you can put in your back pocket and you can go out and in real time you can get a reading and it can actually tell you a lot about what's going on in the overall system um, in real time. So I like to use the metaphor of uh, how many calories do we have to eat per day? Um, we've heard about this thing where, you know, children need 500 calories per day and adults need 2,000 calories per day and pregnant women need 4,000 calories per day or whatever the numbers are. You've heard this idea. Everybody's comfortable with the idea. We may not agree with it. I don't care. But um, <clears throat> the idea is that in different stages of your life, you have different nutritional needs. And um, my understanding is for the plant, it's the same. When the plant is young, it doesn't need as much nutrition. When it's pregnant, it needs a lot more. And those nutrients that are coming into the plant are coming into the plant in the form of ions, whether they're simple, you know, just a nitrogen ion, or they're a complex ion like an amino acid or something like that. They're ions that can be measured with a conductivity meter. Electrical conductivity will tell you functionally how much nutrition is flowing in the soil right now for your plants, how much is available right now for your plants to eat. I think of it as a really good way to proactively see how much food my plants have to eat. And if I see the conductivity drop, then I know my plants are going to be hungry and I should expect to see the, uh, the lipids coming off of the leaf. The plant will go from shiny to not shiny and then it'll begin to get not green anymore 
based on the fact that it doesn't have any food to eat, which I can tell by sticking something in the ground and getting a reading in real time. So for me, this is a really empowering um, you know, process as of being able to proactively monitor things. Um, I'll talk about it now as it pertains to um, planting because uh, in my experience, in many cases, in the spring, when you go to put your seedlings into the ground, um, the conductivity is insufficient for your plants to grow. There's just not enough nutrition available, and which is why when you put your plants in the ground in the spring, they sit there. It's because they don't have any food to eat, because the soil's too cold, because the soil life's not functioning, and it's the soil life that's doing the job of digesting the soil to feed the plant. And so you can see in real time, boop, boop, conductivity 30. Yep, well, I should expect these brassicas to sit here for a week until the flea beetles come and eat them all up. When I was a kid, it happened year after year after year. We just stopped doing brassicas in the spring because the flea beetles always came and ate them all up. We never knew that we could actually proactively monitor and, main, and maintain the nutrient availability in real time. So um, conductivity is measured in um, either milli or micro siemens. Siemens, S-I-E-M-E-N-S, -E -E like the company. Um, for the life of me, I cannot remember which one's which. So uh, one of them, uh, the target level is 0.15, and one of them is 150 when you put the plants in the ground. You want to get your conductivity meter and stick it in the ground and you want to see a reading of this before you put your plants in the ground. Um, a conductivity meter, I don't bring them with me on the airplane because they get taken away by the TSA uh, because they have this little probe piece on it. It's a little metal probe, it's about that size. That's like a pretty much exactly how big a, like, um, a uh, <clears throat> conductivity meter is. Um, it's got a little on button, it's got a little screen, and you just take it and you put it in the soil, you will turn it on, put it in the soil, and you'll get a number that pops up on the screen, like that. It's really cool. And you can put it into the soil one inch, or two inches, or four inches. You can put it in the middle of the bed, the side of the bed, the pathway. All of a sudden you're like, huh, oh, hmm, oh, huh, huh, interesting. All of a sudden you get these numbers, and they vary, right? It's like 150 here and 300 over there and 500 over there. What, 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 what's going on? And then you can stand back and you can see, based on the conductivity, how things are growing better over here and worse over there. And pretty soon you don't need the meter anymore because you can see the plants and you can see the nuances and the variation. And you can see, oh, middle of the bed, things are turning yellow, conductivity's low, edge of the bed, things are still green, plenty of energy, great. I need to do something to stimulate the middle of the bed. I can see this is running out of gas. Um, so anyway, it's a really exciting um, uh, you know, tool to have in the toolbox. Um, what I, conductivity meter. Is higher better or is too high something that's bad? Yeah, so we want to see a continuum that proceeds through the growing season. It looks something along the lines of this. Each of these hash marks being a weekly check. I remember when I was in 18 and I was part of this agricultural exchange program and I was in Siberia um, farming randomly. Um, there was a, a woman from Iowa who was part of the program also and somebody had asked us whether Americans believed in God. And she said yes and I said no. <laughs> and we looked at each other. I was like, no they don't. She's like, yes they do. <laughs> so anyway. Different parts of the country, different things, you know. I think the idea of devoting at least an hour a week to communion with the divine and in whatever way you define it is still a good idea, whether you're a Christian or you're a pagan or whether you're, you know, I don't care what you call it. As far as I'm concerned, the idea of communion and taking time to put aside to actually connect is a, is a I think that's a nice cultural framework to have. Um, so I'm going to propose whether or not you go to church on Sunday morning or Saturday or Friday or it doesn't really matter, um, an hour a week out in the garden might not be a bad thing to do. I suggest, you know, Tuesday morning at 7. Um, <laughs> put it on your calendar. Find a window when you're otherwise not occupied and, and, and set aside an hour a week to go out and to commune with your plants, to actively go and check in on each, you know, plot, each crop. Um, you know, take a moment, say, hey guys, how's it going? What's up? 
uh, get your conductivity meter out, check the soil, get your refractometer, test the, test the leaf. You know, you can, if you're a studious kind of person, you can have a little spreadsheet and you can write the numbers down. You can track them over time and you can see things. My experience is the people who actually actively engage in the process of once a week deeper check-in with numerical, you know, empirical stuff and the subtler pieces, which we'll talk a lot about next with the visual analysis, um, really have a much deeper direct sense by the end of the growing season. If you just spend one growing season with one hour a week, you know, actively focused on being present with the plants, um, your ability to see what's in front of you is going to be dramatically, dramatically enhanced. So, um, uh, yeah, I suggest generally this 150 baseline for starting. Um, the peak, something along, I mean, actually, all this is fungible, of course, right? Everything's fungible. I'm giving you numbers, but there's, there's always cases where they're not true. So I'm going to say the peak level here, um, maybe 250, if you have an organic matter percent of 10, but maybe 650 to 800 if you have an organic matter percent of 1. So the more organic matter you've got in the soil, the more of these ions are actually buffered by the organic matter and will not show up on the meter. So the higher your organic matter is, the lower this number can be, and everything's still fine. Does that make sense? Um, you're going to have to learn over time what conductivity readings in your soil correlate with vigor and vitality in your plants and play around with it. Um, um, you would like to see this natural, slow-release fertilizer effect of conductivity increasing in your soil, that should happen based on the plants making sugar, injecting it into the soil, feeding the soil life, soil life digesting the minerals, you know, more mineral availability, nutrient availability in the soil. That's nature's slow release fertilizer, is plants growing and feeding the soil life and the soil life digesting the soil. That's like, there's all these pelletized fertilizers where you put it down, it's like it's slowly available over the next three months, or you can just work with, with nature and you should have that effect anyways. If it gets too high, you can burn the roots, right? I mean, if you dump a bunch of salt on there, you're going to get a conductivity spike. And functionally, nutrients are moving too fast to be held by the roots, but they're actually, you can literally burn the roots. So in general, over 1,000 is considered to be um, danger zone, uh, and in which case you want to be adding something like humates to slow things down. You want to be adding some sort of a carbon source that will buffer that and that will hold those nutrients. Um, if you're going to be using synthetic fertilizers, urea, and all that kind of stuff, buffering it with something like humates will make it much less toxic. You can get the, you know, the benefit of the nutrients without the detriment of their burning the soil by buffering them with something like humates. Get a question? Uh, I just, on the conducti uh, conductivity meter, so I bought a, a little green meter uh, that was a three-in-one. It gives you the temperature, the pH, and the fertility. Mm -hmm. And you get numbers off that. Is that is that a, is that so? So when they're measuring fertility, is that is that what that's doing, or is that just some? I don't know. <laughs> if it's if, if you can read the if it's measuring either milli or micro siemens. No, it's not. I, I don't know. It just gives you a number. You know, where it's, it's the higher the number uh, is, is more fertile. What, mm -hmm. However, they determine. Fertile. There's your question. I don't know. Yeah, couldn't say. Um, all right. So it is about. Uh, 10.35, can we take uh, till 10.50, 13 minutes, stretch and pee and coffee and uh, we'll reconvene. <laughs>